Hello everyone and welcome to SEO Daily. I'm Gauri Kashyap and today I'll be breaking down the arguments made on day one of hearings in the challenge to the 2018 electoral bond scheme. The scheme was first introduced in the 2017-18 union budget as a way to cleanse the system and facilitated anonymous political funding. NGOs Association for Democratic Reforms, Common Cause and the Communist Party of India Marxists filed petitions in the Supreme Court challenging the amendments arguing that the scheme allowed non-transparency in political funding and legitimized electoral corruption at a huge scale. In October 2023, advocate Prashant Bhushan for Association of Democratic Reforms asked for the case to be heard at the earliest in light of the upcoming 2024 general elections. On day one of arguments, Bhushan argued that non-disclosure of the details of the buyer meant that the larger public could not access information on which political party was being funded by whom. Even the Election Commission of India was privy only to the quantum of donation, not its source. In an interim order in 2021, the Supreme Court had said that transactions are not behind iron curtains and that all that is required is a little effort to cull out such information. Noting that financial statements of companies were easily accessible on the Ministry of Corporate Affairs website and that political parties filed mandated statements of accounts, the court had held that the information could be put together using match the following approach. Bhushan argued that there are 23 lakh registered companies in India and one would have to comb through all of it to ascertain how much each company had donated. Ordinary citizens, he stated, could not collect this information. Bhushan then read out Jaintilal Ranchordas Koticha v. Tata Iron and Steel, a 1975 judgment, where Justice M.C. Chagla said that democracy cannot function unless the voters have all the necessary information about the parties for whom they are going to vote. This went hand in hand with Union of India versus Association for Democratic Reforms, a 2002 judgment in which the court held that freedom of speech and expression included the right to get material information with regard to a candidate who is contesting elections. Advocate Shadan Farasat, appearing for CPIM, added that the electoral bond scheme was a legally ordained information black hole and that it violated the idea of an informed electorate under Articles 191A and 326. Bhushan then argued that the scheme ensures that only government agencies, that is, State Bank of India and law enforcement agencies, can access this information. In that sense, the ruling party could, after exerting some pressure, ascertain the details of the donations. Sibyl brought in another angle to this concern. Let's talk politics, he said, arguing that any corporation that makes a sizable donation will themselves disclose information to the political party in return for favours. Therefore, in reality, Political parties need not go to the SBI seeking details of the donor. They themselves would come forward with that information, he said. Instead of breaking a rule or regulation, the electoral bond system is bent enough to benefit the corporate sector, Bhushan argued. With no way to track sources of political financing, quid pro quo, kickbacks and money laundering have become rampant. Bhushan referred to ADR's report uh, titled Electoral Bonds and Opacity of Political Funding, which found that 94.25%, that is 12,999 crores, of all the bonds purchased between March 2018 and July 2023 were in the denomination of 1 crore. Therefore, ADR concluded that this meant that the bonds were being purchased by corporations, not individuals. Bhushan added that the unequal use of money power through electoral bonds is making the playing field uneven between the ruling party and the opposition and other individual candidates. The bench noted that even before the electoral bond scheme was introduced, corporate companies could still donate to political parties. However, there was a limit set to how much they could donate, at 7.5% of three years of the company's net profits. Further, they also had the obligation to disclose such a donation, subjecting this transaction to public scrutiny. Under the 2018 scheme, anonymity was maintained not just between the donor and the recipient, but with society at large as well. Sibyl submitted that capital and influence go hand in hand. In a market economy, capital symbolizes power, he said. In his written submissions, he stated that quid pro quo is not always direct. The influence of large political donations is indirect and subtle, as they give corporations heightened access to lawmakers who can introduce favorable policies. This, he argued, severs the link between the voter and the representative. Sibyl went on to argue that the real effect of the electoral bond scheme was vastly unrelated to elections itself. There is nothing in the scheme, he said, which connects the donation made to the participation in the electoral process. It is a means for political parties to be enriched. 
He took the court's attention to the SBI's website's FAQ section, which clarified that a political party may use the account it creates to redeem bonds for any other operations. Further, the party may continue to use the account after the election for normal banking operations. They may also close the account at any point in time. This meant that a political party could receive funds, close the account and use it for absolutely nothing. There is no spending requirement and no accountability. Sybil argued that the electoral bond scheme eliminated any requirements to disclose the details of the political party donations by corporations to their shareholders. In his written submissions, he argued that the scheme permits the board of directors to forego their fiduciary duty to shareholders and to hide the details of which political party the company has funded. Both Bhushan and Sybil argued that if they so wished, a company could make losses to funnel money to political parties without any transparency and shareholder oversight. Shareholders completely lose their agency to decide how a company owned by them should act politically. Farasat argued that the scheme went against popular democracy and shareholder democracy. He argued that political views are a part of the right to conscience under Article 25. Each shareholder may have a certain political view, which they cannot exercise if they are not made privy to which political party their company is donating to. With this, the court completed its first day of hearings in the challenge to the electoral bond scheme. Read our detailed report on this case at scobserver.in. Don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube, WhatsApp and Telegram, where we'll be posting key updates on the top court and explainers on cases that matter to you and me. Thank you for watching.